Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hey, Jonathan. Good, Good to see, see you. you. July. Happy July. July is here. Yeah. Welcome, everybody, to morning prayer. First of the month, morning prayer from Common Prayer. If you're new, you can go to commonprayer.net uh, and follow along on the liturgy. If you don't have it in front of you, it's just fine, but we're glad you could be with us. Uh, we're waiting for our our buddy and our special guest, uh, Robbie Jones. He's an expert and scholar on Christian nationalism. Our theme for the month from Common Prayer, right, Jonathan, is geographical proximity, which we, we, we often think about the, the power of uh, sort of the parish or the, the local church forming a community together that's addressing the, uh, the, the needs and the gifts of our own neighborhood and locality. Uh, but we also thought this year we'd try something a little different with everything happening in our country, the January 6th hearings, the, the growing kind of distorted version of, of our faith that kind of masks itself as nationalism. Uh, we wanted to really address that. And so we're going to talk about that some during the prayers for others. Uh, but just a couple other things uh, going on this month are we, we've got uh, within the Red Letter Christians world, we got this book club going. And this month, our book of the month that many of us will read together is Waging Peace uh, by, by Diana uh, Ostrike. And she's been a staff member of RLC, but she's, she's wonderful. She's also a veteran uh, turned peacemaker and tells her story in that book. We thought it was a great one to read anytime, but especially uh, around July 4th and this month of July. So uh, grab a copy of Waging Peace if you can, and it'll be at the end of the month when Diana joins us. Uh, so that's going on. A few. Is there a here, forum this month? We're, we didn't do a forum this month. We've been hitting about every other month or so. But every other a, month, all right. Man, we did a powerful one last month. If y'all missed it, you can see the video with uh, Charletta Evans, who ha, uh, you just got to watch it. It's, it's so good. I mean, she's had she's been on the forefront of restorative justice, especially what's often called high risk. It's restorative justice when someone's life has been taken. Uh, thinking about what does it look like to repair the, the wounds of that. And even if the person's willing, who was uh, the per perpetrator of violence, um, can we give them space to try to, you know, uh, heal some of the harm that they've done? And I mean, she got an amazing story uh, about her relationship with the young man who took her own little boy's life. So uh, three-year-old, uh, Kassan. So listen to that whole conversation. And some people, you know, they, you know about raw tools, the work we do with the guns to garden tools, but Mike Martin is, Charlotte is on our board and the deeper work, Mike, Mike said this, John, he said, turning the, gun, the guns into garden tools is the easy work, but the hard work and the really the holiest work is this deeper work of uh, restorative justice and de-escalation and a lot mm. of the money that we make off selling the tools and art, we really want to pump into the, these kind of new models and new ways of thinking about justice and how we uh, we we heal the harm that's been done through violent crime and things like that. So yeah, it was good. And we, we you know a couple of years ago we did this reading of uh, Fred uh, Frederick Douglass's speech. What to the slave is the Fourth of July? It's a powerful one. Jonathan was just saying our, our brother Jamar Tisby is going to be doing some stuff around that. Um, there's probably a lot of different events around it. But if you've never read the speech or heard the speech. You, there's different ways you can do it, but you can listen to a bunch of us that read it together, uh, and it's re it's so powerful to hear uh, that that really historic speech. So think about watching that, and we'll try to make the video uh, available for you. Anything else going on in your world, John? Anything else? We, everybody well, needs Douglas to is a good, Douglas is a good one to remember, especially yeah. in these days, because the Supreme Court uh, session just ended, in which there were so many uh decisions that um were hard to receive in the in the justice loving community and uh, douglas is the one who famously stood up in front of the dispirited and discouraged crowd after the dred scott decision which said that the um the negro had uh, no rights that a white man was uh, bound by the constitution to respect and uh he said that uh this is a dark day Mm. But he said, this will only serve to 
further our agitation <laughs> and to bring people to our cause. <laughs> and he, and he, he riled them up by saying, this kind of extremism can only mean that we must have something powerful going in our movement. <laughs> and and that was just on for another decade to see the end of slavery. So that's a, a powerful reminder when we're seeing the court make some terrible decisions. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, I was telling John and two before we got started that that my mom's been having some little heart uh, complications. So as we go to prayer, y'all could be thinking of her, uh, Patricia Lafon, my, my mom, as she's a, and I'm sure there's other requests that are out there. But just because more than anything, we're friends. We don't just gather for prayer because we it's the first of the month, but because we care about each other. So that's on my heart as I'm going to prayer. And I appreciate you all lifting up my mama. Uh, and um, Anything else in your world we should be praying for, Jonathan? <clears throat> well, I'm praying for a, a family and a, a dear community here in North Carolina. We, you know, you and I were together with many folks who were with us this morning in D.C. And yeah. uh, a, a, a community down the road here that organized a bus and came up. Uh, the woman who organized the bus uh, went to the hospital with COVID last week and, mm. uh, and died. And so mm. we're praying for her family and that community and that time of loss. Yeah, we will for sure. All right. Uh, well, this month, y'all, we, we give you a little month of the glance. So uh, we, we remember, it's interesting, on July 4th, uh, we remember Martin of Tours, um, who was one of the great uh, war resistors, conscientious objectors. So it, it's an interesting day to remember him. And uh, so you can read about him on July 4th. On the 6th, we remember, I might say this wrong, John, Jan Hus, uh, is that right? Something like that, uh, that from yeah. the Moravian church. But I, I don't know how to say his name, but his story is incredible. And uh, I've gotten to know the Moravian church and it's a really interesting stream and in history of, of our faith. So check that out on the 6th. On the 9th, we remember our, our, our friends in Israel and Palestine uh, especially uh, on the in the West Bank and Gaza on the side of the wall over there in Palestine, because on the 9th of July, the international court uh, ruled that the wall was illegal and needed to come down. But it also shows how complicated these uh, international communities are uh, when it comes to actually seeing those, those changes happen. So we remember mm -hmm. that conflict and our, our Palestinian friends. Um, on the 10th, we remember one of the great Japanese pacifists uh, and and uh, uh, figures in the church, Toyohiko Kagam, Kagawa. And uh, he, he's got a fascinating story too. So we remember him on the 10th. On the 11th is St. Benedict. On the uh, uh, 17th, I think it is, is when the first women's rights gathering happened in uh, 1848. It's on the 19th, the, the women's rights gathering uh, in 1848. And so many things came out of that. So we even remember, of course, right now, everything that's happening um, to really uh, limit women's rights on their, their, their own reproductive rights. So let's, let's remember that this month. And then right after that, we remember Mary Magdalene, one of the great women of the church. Uh, we remember uh, on the 25th, our friends in Puerto Rico, uh, the U.S. invaded Puerto Rico and recolonized it in 1898. So we remember uh, that. And on the 26th, we uh, celebrate the first civil rights law for folks with disabilities. Uh, in 1990, George Bush passed that. On the 30th, we remember uh, Wilberforce, one of the the, the powerhouses uh over in the U in the UK um, and the 31st we remember Ignatius so uh, that's just a little bit of what we got to look forward to in July thank you um, everybody for joining us we're going to dive into our prayer and I hope our brother Robbie Jones shows up and if not we'll have a great conversation together with all of you and with each other so here we go let us pray O oh Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you as the day rises to meet the sun. O oh Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, 
is now and will be forever. Amen. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. O Lord, hear my prayer. O oh Lord, hear my prayer, when I call, answer me. O oh Lord, hear my prayer, O oh Lord, hear my prayer, come and listen to me. We have come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. This is Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I am hard pressed. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you worship dumb idols and run after false gods? Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. When I call upon the Lord, God will hear me. We have come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. Our text this morning comes from Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and blaspheming. They contradicted what was spoken by Paul. Then both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you. Since you reject it and judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life, we are now turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, so that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the word of the Lord, and as many as had been destined for eternal life became believers. Thus the word of the Lord spread throughout the region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their region. So they shook the dust off their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We have come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. This is a quote this morning from Irish missionary Columbanus, and he wrote this, Seek then the highest wisdom, not by arguments in words, but by the perfection of your life, not by speech, but by the faith that comes from simplicity of heart. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, this theme we have today of the uh, religious nationalism that we are always susceptible to, it's right there in that text in Acts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the good news that the people of God are blessed comes first to Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. I have blessed you. And always, right there from the beginning, and have chosen you to be a blessing to the nations. But I take the temptation of religious nationalism to always be that those who are told that they're blessed can come to believe that their blessing somehow makes them better than others, gives them power over others, makes them able to uh, say, we are in and you are out. And it seems to me that's precisely what's happening here when Paul and Barnabas bring the good news that the story is being fulfilled, that God is bringing to fruition the blessing that has been promised for so long. The people say, oh, no, no. If that means those people are in, then that can't be the good news for us. Um, I think that's yeah. what we're still dealing with in some sense. Yeah. Nationalism. I th- you know, I was thinking of uh, that quote 
uh, Mother Teresa had a quote. She said, sometimes our biggest problem is that the circle we put around our family is too small. Mm. And uh, that, that seems, you know, the problem with the nationalism is that it's not that um, we don't care about the people in our own country. It's just that we love bigger than that. And if, if mm. someone's hurting on the other side of some uh, national border, it's just as tragic. They're just as much made in the image of God as any of us are. And I, I think that's one of the real radical things we see Jesus doing, right? Is saying, mm. who is my family? You know, they're like your mother and brothers are here, biological mother and brothers. He's like, we got to think bigger than that. You know, unless one extends that love that we give to our own family to everybody else, then we're not really born again. And, and um, that that's, you know, I think when it comes to patriotism and, um, a love for our own people that, that's a good thing but you know our love should extend beyond nationalism and borders and and the people who are like us who are often the easiest for us to love and even our own biological family of course we love them but we we gotta love even bigger than that right i think that's right and i, I think that the question that paul asked the church mm -hmm. when he got such pushback on this it seems like a pretty basic point of Christian doctrine, right? This notion that God has called us and blessed us in order to be a blessing to everyone. But Paul preaches that and gets extreme pushback, gets attacked, gets, you know, stoned, from running out of town, other things. And when he's writing to the Galatians and trying to explain this point that, that God has uh, uh, brought the good news to all nations, um, mm. not not to exclude anybody, not to, you know, supersede what has happened in any way, but to, to, to include everyone that God loves and God made into God's family. And when the folks who uh, are so resistant to that in Galatia, when, when Paul confronts them, he asks this question, he says, who has bewitched you? You remember that? <laughs> who, who has cast a spell over you? What is it that has gotten you so twisted? And I think that's an important question for us to ask. Mm. You know, mm. when we see so many people in the name of Jesus mm. advocating for things that Jesus is just, in his own words, diametrically opposed to, you know, yeah. when people are running on Jesus, guns, and babies in Georgia. Oh, and Jesus yeah. said, essentially, if you translate it into the language of our day, if you live by the gun, you're going to die by the gun. Yeah. You know, it's a direct contradiction to what Jesus did. What Jesus yeah. said, when Jesus said, blessed are the poor, and you got a whole Christian nationalist movement that blames poor people for their poverty and says poor people are cursed. Yeah. It's the direct opposite of what, so who has bewitched us? I think that's a question we have to consider when we consider this question of Christian nationalism, because there's something going on here that's bigger than just, you know, a, a kind of a misreading or a simple mistake. We are under some kind of a spell. <laughs> Bewitched us. Woo. Bewitched yeah. Us. You know, and I, I think of this, you know, you, you went to the, the, the Bewitched verse in Galatians, and I, I think of this one too from right in the first chapter of Galatians. So, you know, Paul writes and he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, mm. which is really no gospel at all. And isn't that something mm. that, that there, that, that, that is really what it feels like that there is another gospel. That's really no gospel at all. And it's certainly not the gospel. That's good news to the poor and liberation for the oppressed. It's not the gospel of Jesus, but it really is the gospel of America. And mm. we're missing our, our buddy, Robbie Jones. He might come in, but the, here's the good news. Y'all is we all got to hang out a, a few weeks ago and talk about all this. And Robbie's been, really one of the, the the scholars trying to help us define like all right you know there, there's like kind of different levels of the funk when it comes to this I mean you got some nationalistic stuff that happens on July 4th but you know a lot of folks that haven't totally bought into this so he helps us kind of get some handholds right Jonathan on like what do we mean by Christian nationalism and it's things like do we believe that America has a unique destiny in the plan of God for the redemption of the world. So you kind of begin to 
replace Jesus as God's messianic force in the world with America. And you, and you, re, you, you really start to say America is God's hand or chosen nation, right? Uh, that was one of them. And there's a, there's a few more, right, about the, like, did God inspire the founding documents of America and things like that? But what are some of the other, you know, kind of handholds, Jonathan, as we, like, people, not everybody, you, that language is getting used a lot today, but that's right. people might not be able to clearly define what we mean by Christian nationalism. You know, it's a, it's a good point. So, so Robbie is a sociologist and has been working with others to, to run surveys that ask these questions. And uh, another sociologist at Yale, Philip Gorski, talks about the deep story of Christian nationalism that those kind of questions point to, right? Um, the, the, this isn't new. This has been around for a long time. Um, and there have been people who have argued that, um, that God uniquely inspired the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, that uh, there was some sort of manifest destiny in the colonization and occupation, occupation of these lands that uh, God is somehow working in a unique way through the United States of America to uh, bless the world, sort of replacing what we were just talking about in terms of Paul's vision of the church with America. So America becomes God's instrument in the world. Uh, I think there are deep theological problems with that, and that is a deep story. That's not new. Um, but what... Uh, uh, other sociologists have tried to measure more recently is uh, what are the new things that are being sort of globbed on to that story and used to sort of excite people to uh, enact this story in a sense. Um, so one of the striking things Ravi has found in his research is that currently, in the most recent survey he did, a quarter of uh, people who identify as Republican in the United States uh, are also willing to uh, say on in, in response to a survey that violence may be required in order to uh, 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 preserve their version of what the country should be. Uh, so you think about something like the January 6th insurrection and uh, uh, the, the, that was among Republicans. The numbers I think go up even higher when you get people who identify strongly with this Christian nationalist story. So if you believe that God has some sort of uh, special plan for America and for an America that is led by white Christian men, uh, it turns out that uh, 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 at least a plurality of uh, those people uh, might be willing to also take up arms and fight for that vision. And that begins to be very dangerous as we've been seeing in the, you know, uh, in the evidence of the January 6th committee that's been presented, you know, over the last several weeks on television, uh, you get people who believe this and who believe it not simply as a sort of matter of their political commitments, but as a central part of their identity of who they are. And uh, it, it becomes a very dangerous situation. And I think that that's what leads me to think that that language of being bewitched, being sort of possessed by a power that is beyond our kind of sort of rational decision-making. I think that's what's going on because, uh, you know, uh, these are people who love their kids and families and, you know, are, I'm sure are decent in lots of ways, and yet they can get so caught up in this narrative that they're willing to do things that I think perhaps even they, after the fact, would look back and say, how in the world did I do that? Um, some of the people who've been brought to trial from January 6th have essentially yeah, said as Yeah, but some of it is, there is some of it that really is a bewitching of like, how we think of what happened on the January 6th when folks have said, well, I mean, I, I just heard a pastor say that wasn't an insurrection. We're going to show you what an insurrection looks like, that, that there's this and there's this kind of, uh, you know, re, rethinking of history that that this, you know, wasn't a violent protest, but was some kind of peaceful thing. And it's amazing how quickly we can have amnesia about what, what happened well, that <laughs> not that too. long ago. But you know that memory Which is of why having the truth telling is so important. The the Jesus sign, Jesus saves flags and signs and the Christian flags next to the Confederate flags, and so that's what we're talking about uh, when we think of this. And and I think it's important that you know there are there are the the really extreme places like we you know went to the NRA prayer breakfast uh, last month and there was the Pledge of Allegiance, the National Anthem, at a prayer breakfast, right? I mean, and 
and uh, almost no prayer at all, uh, no mention of Jesus, you know, and so that's where uh, you, you really see it starkly. But when we, you know, I think there's a lot of folks that right now feel like they're battling for the soul of our country. And mm. you and I have a little bit of empathy for that because we organized some of this when we were in high school to see you at the polls where we're going to put oh, yeah. prayer back in the, in the public schools and things. But some of this is about what does it look like to be a Christian in America and a pluralistic society? Um, and, and how much do we put our beliefs? Cause our convictions are important. I don't think anyone's saying we should compromise our convictions. So what does it look like for someone who is a Christian that's trying to honor their Bible uh, inspired convictions on things like uh, uh, abortion or guns or whatever it is. And um uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, the, the, the kind of fight for power and to put those beliefs into practice is a tricky thing because I, I think you and I have both had an, uh, our own unique evolution in what that looks like. And we yeah. some of those convictions have changed, but some haven't, you know, for me. And uh, but the posture to power is what's kind of changed, I think, for me, like well, how I, much I, I look for America to yeah. be the church. Right. Right. I think that's a piece of it. Um, for me, a big piece of it, too. I mean, I, I was deep in the kind of uh, formation programs as a young person of the religious right. Um, I don't know if everybody on here knows, but I, I paged for Senator Strom Thurmond on Capitol Hill. So, uh, I, you know, I was right there in the Capitol Hill Bible studies and those kind of things that were happening back in the 90s. Um, and part of what opened my eyes to the um, the real uh, well to go back to Galatians the, the real false gospel that is being pushed uh, as religious nationalism is I began to see how much money was invested in uh, teaching us to read the Bible this way and I started to learn where some of that money was coming from and so over the past 40 years um, if you look at the Council for National Policy and the way that uh, the private family foundations of extremely wealthy families in the United States, along with big oil money and the um, money of some independent media companies, uh, has really focused on uh, decade after decade building this narrative that was almost exclusively aimed at white Christians at first, is, is now tried to build out a little broader of a coalition with black and brown folks, but still using the same cultural values that they developed in conversation with white Christians and white Christians in the South. And in a lot of ways, if you look at it historically, uh, it was a, co a very highly funded coalition that mirrored the coalition that had resisted the civil rights movement. Right, But now instead of organizing people around their race, those same people got together and organized people around their religion. And that to me was a kind of eye opener that uh, what was going on here was not about uh, teaching us how to put our faith into practice in public, but was rather about people who were already very engaged in public life for their own ends, trying to get Christian people to join them and their causes uh, for the sake of uh, uh, their faith. And I, I, don't, I really don't think there's um, a single issue where that's more um, clear or uh, sort of highlighted than the so-called pro-life movement of the last 40 years because, um, because all of the organizations and all of the legal movements that allied to you know, calling themselves pro-life in order to overturn Roe, which just happened, all of them were at the very same time committed to destroying the environment, promoting guns, denying health care, uh, denying union rights, denying civil rights. I mean, the whole package is anti-life in every way except this one issue, because that's the issue that they were organizing people around, religious people, to get them to be part of their voting coalition. And so I, I think that's the kind of reckoning that we're in right now. We have to come to terms with the political reality in which religious communities have been manipulated in order to become part of a coalition whose ends are largely against the ends of 
uh, Jesus in the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th when I think of uh, uh, w what's happened with the Roe versus Wade and, and what's happening right now in the Supreme Court, it, it, it reminds me of the words of Jesus. So uh, what, what, what does it profit us to gain the whole world and lose our soul? Or, or we mm -hmm. might say, what does it uh, profit to gain the whole Supreme Court and lose our soul? Uh, mm -hmm. And on many of these uh, other issues. I mean, it's it's it shouldn't be missed that the same week that the the Supreme Court ruled against states' rights to try to limit gun violence by yeah. regulating some of the gun laws, they ruled in favor of states' rights to be able to uh, regulate uh, abortion and, and women's rights to their, their and, and and so uh, and and on the death penalty, we've got a vigil happening right now, y'all. Uh, mm -hmm in front of the Supreme Court, because this is the anniversary this week of when the Supreme Court, the 50th anniversary of um, when the Supreme Court stopped executions and then a few years later allowed them to resume is all in this same week. So our friends at Death Penalty Action are vigiling out there because this same court what, that many people are saying is pro-life is continuing over and over to uh, rule in favor of the death penalty and, and this was at a point where we were right at the brink of hmm. seeing a supreme court that might rule that the death penalty um, should be abolished and the, i mean the actual ruling would be that it's a violation of the unusual part of cruel and unusual punishment because we've evolved hmm. in how we think of punishment and we that's happened a lot over the years you know that we don't uh, hmm. are supposed to not be executing minors we're supposed to not be executing that have special um, intellectual disabilities and things like that. So yeah. there's this, yeah. We don't but torture that, yeah. people anymore in the hopes that they'll repent of their sins. You know, right. That was punishment at one time. <laughs> yeah, well, being bewitched, you know, the Salem witch trials, we executed yeah. people for uh, what, yeah, I mean, just allegations of sorcery or witchcraft. So, so uh, but I, I think, you know, one of the things that maybe we could create a better conversation around is, what would it look like, as Jesus said, for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven? What would it look like for God's dream to come on earth? And that's where this, you know, idea of, uh, I mean, we're, we're praying that on our own block, you know, right here in North Philly. What does it look like for God's dream? It's not to hear gunshots all the time, to see kids that are losing their lives to guns. And what, what, it, what would it look like? If we lived into God's dream for America, I can't help but think we would do a better job at welcoming immigrants and asylum seekers, you know, and, and that's where I think if that's our big question, then we can say this is not just about uh, a Christian America. It's about an America that that honors loving our neighbor as ourself, the great command of Jesus, you know, and we can work with anybody to build that. That doesn't that's not just our our turf right we can work That's with people right, of other yeah. faiths or no faith to build it yeah you know one of the reasons early on in my life i got uh, inspired by the monastic vision was the testimony of pacomius you remember that story pacomius mm. was the founder of communal monasticism and his testimony was that as a young person uh, he was uh, thrown into jail because of a political conflict where he grew up he was on the side of the losers and he was in jail and uh, it was terrible conditions. You know, they were hardly surviving in this jail, feeding them bread, moldy bread and water or whatever. And these people started bringing them food at the window every day and feeding them. And he asked the fellow prisoners, you know, who are these people who feed us? And they said, uh, those people are Christians. They feed us because they say they love Jesus and they see Jesus in us. Mm. And that's why he became a Christian because, uh, you know, Christians were the sort of people who fed prisoners. And he thought that was good news. And his, his whole vision of, of, uh, sort of communities of love was that, um, as, as he said, he had a dream in which uh, he saw the whole world and honey was dripping over the world. And he said, oh, that's, wow. that's what God's vision for the world is that, that, that the sweetness of Christianity would just flow over it, uh, you know, so that it would kind of be sweet, good news to everybody. Mm. And I just think, um, you know, how many people who aren't Christian think of Christians that way? particularly in this country that, you know, it's just good to have a Christian neighbor, mm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just good to have somebody that, that loves you because they see Jesus in you. I don't think that's the kind of witness we're inspiring when uh, so much of 
Christian public witness has been about trying to grab onto power and say that, you know, our moral position on this or that uh, should be superior uh, over yours and should be implemented by the law. Mm. Uh, I mean, I don't care what you think about abortion. Uh, to, to say that, uh, you know, a, a court or a legislature has power over the decisions that somebody else has to make, you know, often in very difficult circumstances, uh, that's not a way to inspire neighborliness, doesn't seem mm. to me, to inspire people to say, oh, I, I, I think it's good to have Christian neighbors. Mm. I think we should start a movement to have Christians who people would want to be neighbors with. Mm. Mm. That's what Pacomius makes me think, you know? How about that? I think I might start a band. It's called Sweet Honey and the Rock. How about that? Uh, <laughs> I like that. I like that honey vision. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, when you think about the places where Christianity has managed to acquire these power structures, um, and it really does lose its soul. And we see it a hundred years later in kind of the ruins of Christendom and the kind of churches that become historic landmarks and museums and and uh and yet where you see the church alive is where it's still this sort of countercultural uh, um you know presence in the world that's uh, that's is proclaiming that love and um we we, we sure got to take some lessons from that you know that we're not to be the moral gatekeepers of society but we're to be that conscience that dr king spoke of neither the servant or the master of the state but the conscience of the state and and yeah. uh that that presence in the world that you almost can't even see the the, the yeast in the bread you know the salt the light and uh boy I, I we're in a tough place right now i think when people are wanting that power because you, you think about jesus y'all right how jesus came with it, every element of Jesus messianicness is that a word John messianic every bit of his uh, being the messiah was a re repudiation a rebuke of the messianic expectation that people had that yeah. he would come kill all the bad guys he would come you know turn everything on his head take take the power back make rome great again mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever you know and jesus comes and is born in the most vulnerable way uh lean, leans into the margins his whole life and is you know dies on a cross and even even peter when he when jesus tells him he's going to die peter's like no you don't die like kings don't die like this is not good this is not how the story is supposed to end and jesus calls him satan and says you're st you know you're still thinking with the mind of this world not the mind of god so we got a lot of, of, of that other mindset in the church, mm. right? That's thinking with the power of this world, the structures of this world, how we're going to get rid of evil, or we're going to uh, uh, control people's decisions in the way that we think they should make them rather than, uh, uh, you know, have, have the, the humility to know that the spirit's working. So it's, it's, a, it's a critical time for our country, isn't it, Jonathan? For the country, certainly. For the potential of democracy, which you know I don't think is an ultimate end, but um, it's it's uh, more a reflection of the beloved community than what we see right now, right? And uh, and I think on top of that, it's a critical time for the church because um, you know whether democracy survives or not, what the church has to grapple with is in the midst of the decline of the American empire. What sort of witness did we offer? Right, mm. what, because uh, I mean, ultimately we're living in a story in which kingdoms rise and fall, mm -hmm. but we say the word of the Lord endures forever, which means you're either gonna be on God's side and endure forever or you're not. <laughs> mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't wanna be on the side of the, uh, uh, of the things of this world that are being wiped away because um, it seemed like it would benefit uh, me and my people for a short time no no let's play let's play the long game here right uh yeah jesus, jesus has told us what lasts forever and the way that we can live in uh in you know in that way and that's um uh, that's the order that's the order of the day 
can we walk in that way? Can we live in that way? Can we partner with others in a way that reflects God's goodness in the struggles of our time? Because my, my, we sure are in the midst of struggles. Yeah, I think of our brother, uh, Tony Campolo. You know, he often tells that story of the, the apocalyptic uh, image that we have in Revelation of the fall of Babylon, right? And he mm-hmm. says, uh, you know, there's this vision of the new Jerusalem coming and the fall of the empire of Babylon. And uh, he says there's two responses that we see in the scripture. If you look closely at it, uh, he says there's the, the merchants and the kings mm-hmm. of the earth, and they are devastated when Babylon falls. They said, oh, how could this happen? To yeah. Babylon the Great, they had made so much money and power off of her, and um, and that, so there's that response of the the weeping of the merchants, and he says, but the angels, it says, they rejoice, mm-hmm. and they they invite the the new Jerusalem, and and the fall of Babylon is something that they are are celebrating and so tony always says will you be rejoicing with the the angels or will you be weeping with the kings and the merchants uh but uh, you know who knows what will happen to our country but you know empires come and they fall but the gospel lives and the question is uh, you know how we'll live in the midst of of these times and you know i, I think as we close john then maybe we talk just a little bit about some ways that you know we kind of have this this big narrative of we want to challenge christian nationalism with the true gospel of jesus and um sermon on the mount the stuff we see in the red letters but we've done some real concrete things so maybe we could give give so folks a few resources or ways that we're already responding and we want to hear what y'all are doing too because a lot of these have been collaborative and one of them was right after january 6th um we collaborated with uh hundreds of other people to make a statement uh, against Christian nationalism. And statements don't change everything. There's a lot of statements out there. But January 6th was a unique moment where we felt like we did need a statement. And even in the statement, we said, we wrote into it, we need more than a statement. Like we need to really uh, respond seriously uh, to January 6th. But you can see that statement and and a reading of it from dozens of us that put our voices together to read it at say no to christian nationalism uh, dot org and i think that's linked up but that's a it is a really powerful statement that we invite you to you know maybe invite your own church or your own circle of friends or your organization to stand behind um and then you know, what are some other resources that, that you've seen, John? And there's some on the, the, the Christians Against Christian Nationalism, which was one of our partners in all of that. They've done a lot of curriculum uh, and things. Um, yeah, that's our friends at the Baptist Joint yeah. Committee uh, who've also been building a coalition. I think those kinds of public witness are crucial. Uh, we have to, as Christians, make it clear that Christian nationalism does not represent a majority of Christians. Um, and I think we can do that in collective ways, both of which you've mentioned. The other thing, I've, I've, over the past two years, um, I've worked a lot with pastors around the country who are grappling with this in their congregations because there are so many of these organizations that are promoting Christian nationalism that are targeting conversation, yeah. congregations through the lay people. So the pastors and church leadership are trying to negotiate you know, how to respond to this. And um, in all of those conversations, the thing that has come to me again and again is that i think on the local level the single most important thing that a christian can do that a congregation can do to counter this is to be very publicly supportive of good things that are happening that the church or christians are not controlling right the church can use its voice its power its influence to bless something else Mm. Uh, and in so doing, demonstrate a different way of being Christian. Mm. So maybe, you know, it's the local movement for a living wage. We've had a huge uh, movement to organize service workers across the country this year. Uh, You know, you've probably seen it in the news, Mm -hmm. Amazon workers, uh, Starbucks workers, Dollar General workers, you know, people who are saying we cannot live on what we're making uh, and these corporations are earning billions and billions of dollars, and their own workers are often on government support. So uh, in the midst of that, uh, there are these movements, local movements for living wages, the Fight for 15, other groups like that. And uh, for a church 
to come along and say, uh, we want to be a member of the coalition. We want to support this. We want to show up when the workers organize and we want to say that their demand is not simply, you know, a, a, a demand of the worker against the boss, but it's a moral demand. It's something that we as people of faith uh, know is good and right. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a huge thing and it's something that that movement has been particularly open to from the very beginning, having uh, clergy and uh, uh, ministers there. What you'll find in those places is that not only um, do you get to show up alongside fellow Christians, but often they're uh, Jewish and Muslim and uh, other faith leaders who are also there. And I think it gives us an opportunity to begin to participate in the kind of coalitions that would allow us to be Christians for the common good, along with all our neighbors, whether they're Christian or not. Yeah. And I, the, the real concrete stuff matters. You know, I mean, there's congregations that are trying to think through how you do the fourth of july services or veterans day services and what you do with the flag on the altar and uh so there's conversations happening about um even in denominations of can we uh do something different with the flag on the altar i mean what does that say about our limited vision when it comes to geographical proximity and nationalism so i met one congregation that tried to put all of the flags of all of the countries and not even center the U.S. one, but just say, this is the whole gospel for the whole world. God so loved the world, not just America. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty ambitious thing to get 200 flags. So some con one pastor, uh, John, just started moving the U.S. flag. He said, I couldn't, when I tried to remove it, that's a little too much for some of our older folks. So I just moved it about a foot every week, uh, a little further and further until I got it back behind the stage. So, <laughs> but you know, the flag is more just the symbol, but y'all, we, we've got a bigger banner that we live under than the American flag, especially those of us who um, uh, dare to try to follow after Jesus. And there's lots of good resources out there. I'll just say John is not a big self-promoter, but the book Reconstructing Gospel, John's book really taps into a lot of this, uh, the, the uh, finding freedom from slaveholder religion. So check that out. In addition to um, Robbie's work, even though he didn't, he didn't make it this morning. He stood us up a little bit this morning, John. We still love him, and we we still, uh, you know, sure love his, book. his books are real helpful. On some here, we should let people know that, yeah, his uh, yeah. his white too long yes. is his most recent uh, work along these lines, and uh, uh, I think very important in terms of helping us understand that the energy behind this particular wave and push of Christian nationalism, uh, you know, he reads the data closely and he says it really began to surge when white Christians became a minority among the electorate at the same time that a black man was president. He can point to exactly the month of the year that happened. I think it was sometime in 2014 or 15, but at any rate, um, uh, he, he's talking about how that uh, has created an identity crisis and that, frankly, white Christians are going to have to decide whether it's more important to them to be white or to be Christian. Yeah. And uh, and, and Robbie, will, we'll, we'll do other stuff with him. We've done several podcasts with with him. Uh, and so you can check you can see uh, him. He's a big part of everything that we're doing at RLC. And there's so many other voices, you know, folks that are uh, hitting this from different angles and uh, uh Actually, I just had Chris and Cassie just joined us, John, and uh, the other day they were here two days ago. So Chris Haw and I, you know, our attempt to kind of get underneath some of this, we did a book, Jesus for President, and um, I'm going to rec record the, uh, we're re-releasing it, John, and I'm doing the a new intro at the Milk Boy studio which is like where all the big recording artists go and there's all the gold records on the wall and I get in there and they're like, oh, this is an audio book. We don't have many of those in the Milk Boy uh, recording studio, so it's always an adventure. But um, yeah, some of you can uh, maybe read that with us, and Chris and I are, would be glad to join you for conversation on that. But we got to keep wrestling with this, y'all, because it really is a, uh, this American nationalism has become another gospel that mm. is competing with the gospel of Jesus, trying to camouflage itself as Christianity. And it's not only a danger to our democracy, as we saw on January 6th, and we see nearly every day from new iterations of that, but it's yeah. also a real danger to our faith and to yeah. what Christianity is about. Uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of people that are going, I want nothing to do with that. And they're rejecting that Christian nationalism, thinking that they're rejecting Christianity when, when it's actually this nationalism has very little to do with Christ to begin with and, and a lot more to do with America. So um, thanks for joining us this morning. And uh, sorry you had to listen to just John and I, but we, we really love being together. So we hope y'all like being with us and we'll close out in prayer here, huh, John? Anything else, man? Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's do it. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven. hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And this is our prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and forgiveness. Help us to hear your word and to follow you today. Numb our ears to the persistent call of idols like vanity, consumerism, power, pride, and nationalism. Enable us to lead lives tempered by the awareness of others' needs and propelled by your love. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Amen. Bless y'all. Bye, everybody. Happy July.